Hi, I'm Andy, and in this video we'll be exploring how to attack, detect, and defend against bypassing user account control. Many of the attacks I've covered so far in this series are either only possible or are made much easier if they are carried out by an account with administrative privileges. So naturally when it comes to talking about defensive measures, one obvious step is to simply not grant admin privileges. But of course this then increases the workload of system administrators as they'd need to help users perform so many day-to-day -day tasks such as installing software or adding device drivers for new hardware. The end result is that users are often granted local administrator rights for the sake of convenience. Microsoft developed User Account Control, or UAC, as a method of reducing some of the risks associated with granting local admin rights. Let's see it in action. Here's a standard user session. We can see from the who am I slash groups command that this user is not part of any administrator group. But permissions in Windows is more complicated than just what group you're a member of. Who am I slash priv lists out the specific operating system permissions for the user. I'm not going to go into any detail here on any individual permission, just note that there's five of them. Now let's say this user is tricked into running some malware which creates a reverse shell back to an attacker running Metasploit. In our scenario here, the attacker wants to grab a copy of all the password hashes on this machine, but to do that needs to elevate their permissions to the system user. Metasploit's built-in getSystem command is a good way of trying a few common methods, but these all fail because the hacker session is running in the context of a low privilege user. This in turn means that the dump hashes command also fails. The hacker needs control of an administrative level session for get system to be able to elevate to the system user. Okay, so let's try this again. Now we have an admin account and the group listing confirms that this user is indeed in the administrator's group. We'll run who am I slash priv to confirm the specific OS privileges and note how we still only have the same five privileges as we saw with the standard user account. This is UAC in action. UAC forces all apps to run in a low privilege context by default and only allows elevation to a higher privilege mode if explicitly authorized by a local administrator. So even if a user is logged in with an admin account like we are here, all applications still operate in a low privilege context unless explicitly approved. Let's see what happens if our user is again tricked into running the same malware. Here we can see this attacker session is now running in the admin user context, but again, any attempt to get system or dump hashes fails. So how does an application manage to really get admin rights? Well, if a developer knows that their app will require higher privileges, then they can code it in such a way so as to request those additional privileges from Windows. Windows triggers a UAC prompt to confirm with the user that they really want to do this. To request the Windows command prompt to run with high privileges, we must right click and choose run as administrator. Note the UAC prompt warning us of potential dangers ahead. We can verify we're running in the context of the same user as before, who is a member of the same groups, but this time a who am I slash priv command shows a whole bunch more extra privileges. All these privileges are then inherited by the malware when it's run from this session. That means the attacker's reverse shell is now actually running with full admin privileges, so the call to get system is successful, and the dump of password hash is now possible. Hopefully this goes to show the value of UAC, although if you hadn't guessed by now, I wouldn't be talking about this topic if there weren't a sneaky way to get around it. And at the time of writing, there's not just one. There's 62. UAC bypass methods stem from the trade-offs that Microsoft has made during the features development. Many users complained about being inundated with Windows nagging them all the time with UAC prompts. So, to reduce some of the noise around UAC, Microsoft created multiple levels of UAC control. The more aggressive behavior could still be selected, but the default would instead be a more relaxed policy, which would allow for a number of common tasks to be performed or low risk trusted apps to run without requiring UAC elevation. 
The problem is, if you allow some programs to bypass UAC, and those programs end up containing vulnerabilities, then they can be exploited to allow other code to bypass UAC too. Lots of very clever people have managed to find many of these such flaws, and these have been collated in the form of UAC me. The GitHub page for this project gives details on each of the flaws and the current status. You can see that many have since been fixed by Microsoft, but many have not, including some which have existed for many years. And more flaws are being discovered all the time. And this isn't even a complete list. Let's try bypassing UAC using the most recent method. Here's the command prompt of an admin user, which is subject to UAC. We can verify the limited permissions using whoami slash priv. Having already compiled the UAC me code from GitHub, performing the bypass is as simple as running the exe and specifying the ID number of the method we'd like to attempt. By default, the code spawns a new high privilege command prompt. Again, we can verify the privileges with whoami slash priv. It's important to note here that there was no UAC consent prompt displayed. We can get UAC me to spawn the same reverse shell payload as we used earlier by passing it as the second argument. Again, note that there is no UAC consent prompt. The command completes and our attacker now has a highly privileged reverse shell which can elevate to system and dump hashes with no problem. I am not going to dig any deeper into the specifics of this particular UAC exploit, but there's a link in the description to a detailed blog post from the exploit's author if you want to know more. Exploit 62 in UAC me abuses a weakness in the computerdefault.exe app. This is the tool used to change the default email program, video player, web browser and so on. We can detect the evidence of this by login process creation events. Here's the syslog events for the period in question. We can see UAC me launch, then it launches computer defaults. This triggers consent.exe, which is responsible for the UAC consent prompt. But remember, computer defaults is one of those apps which can elevate privileges without a prompt. A second computer defaults process then launches, this one now with full admin privileges. Finally, the evil hacker payload is launched. Sysmon records its parent as process 944. That's the ID of the preceding computer defaults process. So this mechanism leaves some traces for forensic analysis, but it would be good to build a rule to be able to alert on future occurrences. Certainly, any new processes being spawned from computer defaults could be used as the trigger. But remember, this combination of events is specific to UAC bypass method number 62. Similar rules would be needed for all those other methods too. The fact that each bypass method has its own combination of steps is not necessarily a bad thing. These can act as a signature for endpoint protection software to not only detect, but block attempts at UAC bypass. Coverage will obviously vary from product to product. Traditional antivirus products may only alert if they see binaries which contain some of the same code as is found in the UAC me source. Although a skilled attacker can just adjust the code to avoid this type of detection. More advanced endpoint protection software may detect and block based on behavior. In other words, looking for those combinations of resulting system calls rather than the underlying code itself. Also, Remember that the bypass techniques exist because some common configuration tasks are exempt from UAC when it's configured with the default security level or lower. However, bumping up the UAC level to its highest removes all of these exclusions. This results in a few more UAC prompts, but does eliminate all of the bypass methods in UAC me. Trying the same attack now triggers a UAC prompt which, hopefully, a user will decline unless they are intentionally trying to access the set program access and computer defaults control panel item. This does of course rely on an element of user education and awareness, and many users will blindly click through simple messages. You can give your users a reason to stop and think more carefully by adjusting this security policy setting. Once enabled, 
UAC prompts will require a user to re-enter their admin credentials. This helps to indicate to the user the significance of the UAC prompt. And again, hopefully, the requirement to enter their password should trigger users to think more carefully about whether the UAC consent matches the activity that they're trying to perform. But still, unless you have a lot of faith in your users, I've got to fall back to my default position at the start of this video. Just don't give out admin privileges unless they are really, really needed. That about wraps up this video. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing if you want more of this sort of content. Drop a note in the comments if there's anything you think I missed around attacking, detecting and defending against bypassing UAC, or if you have a good idea of what topic I should cover next. I'll see you next time.